conversation with the candidate continues right now. Thank you for clicking on our extended digital conversation with the candidate, with our candidate, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Republican candidate for president. We've got 30 minutes commercial free. We're going to get to as many town hall questions as we possibly can. We're going to start off with Barbara Southard. Thank you. Hi, Barbara. First of all, Governor Christie, thank you for your support of Ukraine. Very Appreciate well. that. Well, what do you plan to do to, for us to reach our climate goal of net zero in 2050? Well, I think there's a few things. First of all, I am someone who's in favor of an all of the above strategy we, because we can't disarm ourselves economically while we convert to cleaner energy. And so we can't have our aspirations outstrip our innovation. So I, my best example of this, Barbara, is, you know, California says by 2030, no new gas cars. And then I saw a month or so ago, Governor Newsom sent out an advisory in California that said, don't charge your electric cars tonight, you'll crash the grid. Well, <laughs> doesn't help very much to have an electric car if it's not charged, right? So we can't have our aspirations outstrip our innovation. But here's one thing for sure. Um, I'm someone who favors uh, a greater use of nuclear power. And the reason I do is I've watched the example in my home state. We are the most densely populated state in America. So 9 million people in a very small little space. And... We have gotten 53% of our electricity annually from nuclear. We do it safely in the most densely populated state in America and have been doing that for over 50 years. Nuclear can really help us reach both reliability and to get down to net zero on carbon. We need to continue to, to support and develop wind and solar. When I was governor of New Jersey, we were the second largest solar producing state in the country. You wouldn't have guessed it, Arizona was first, that's an easy guess. But we were number two when I was governor because we, I really felt like we should push the edge of the envelope on that. Because of how densely populated we are, we had a lot of space that we could put these, these um, you know, reflectors on and be able to gather that energy. But we can't abandon oil and gas. And you see up here in, in New Hampshire in particular, the, the lack of natural gas being able to come into this, which is cleaner than oil, certainly cleaner than coal, not being able to get here because of obstructionists in New York and other states is to me wrong. We should use all this as we convert to something that makes sense. And I think we can reach our goals. And as I was mentioning before, we've lowered our carbon output by a billion tons a year for the last 10 years while still using all of these energy systems. If we go to greater nuclear, and Georgia just opened the first new nuclear plant in over 40 years this past week in, in the state of Georgia, I think it's very possible and something that we need to look at very strongly and make it easier for states to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes right. from Ben Bolger. Hey, Ben. Governor, thanks for being here. My name is Ben Bolger. Um, there's a lot of interesting people running for president. What is something that you can do that's unique that only you could do and no one else could do if they were elected president? If elected? Yes. It reminds me of the late 70s, Ben. In the late 70s, you had a country where we had an energy crisis, we had runaway inflation, bad unemployment, we had the Soviets in Afghanistan, hostages in Iran, and a, an Olympic boycott. And the country felt dispirited, and we had a president then, and President Carter, who told us it was our fault. We had a malaise over us. And what we did at that point was turn to a Republican conservative from a blue state. And the reason why Ronald Reagan was so effective on the big problems of this country was because he was unafraid to negotiate and compromise with the other side to get things done. He worked on immigration and got a good immigration solution back in the 80s. He worked on Social Security. And the reason Social Security is still solvent today is because of the deal Reagan made back in the 1980s. I think my experience having a Democratic legislature for all eight years that I was governor, I used to kid all the time that Mary Pat and I spent more time with people we couldn't stand <laughs> than anybody in the entire state of New Jersey. But guess what? Those people were elected too. And if I wanted to get something done, I had to work with them. I take the philosophy that it's a lot harder to hate up close. And that the president needs to once again engage personally with the Congress and work with both sides to say, how can we get to compromise and accomplishment? And that's something that Ron DeSantis had no experience in in Florida, dealing with a rubber stamp Republican legislature. Nikki Haley in South Carolina. 
a rubber stamp Republican legislature there. That's great. I wish I had had a rubber stamp Republican legislature. I really wish I didn't have this experience. Our state would be better off if I didn't. But when preparing for the presidency, this is an enormous asset that other candidates in this race don't have, let alone the candidates who have never run anything. And so we need, once again, we've had presidents. Now think about it. Going back, Barack Obama, one term in the U.S. Senate, never run a thing in his life. We saw the results. Donald Trump ran a family business. Remember, you know, the Trump organization is about 50, 60 employees. If you don't count every cocktail waitress and greenskeeper, okay, it's small. He had no experience running anything like the federal government. And Joe Biden spent 40 years in the United States Senate and eight years as vice president. He didn't run anything there either. We need to have a president again who has run things under difficult, adverse circumstances. And for a Republican, if you're looking for difficult and adverse, come to New Jersey. Uh, we got it. Thank you. Governor. Thanks, Pat. On that topic, Governor, you know, one of the things that Republicans are still angry at you for was basically greeting Barack Obama after he came, when he came for Super Storm Sandy. It's remarkable in some ways that the anger hasn't abated by now, a decade later. Uh, but doesn't that indicate that it's going to be very hard for any president to engage in bipartisan cooperation? No, no, it doesn't. And look, I wouldn't do anything differently if I had to do it all over again. We have one president at a time. My state had just suffered the worst natural disaster in its history and the second worst in the history of this country. And the president of the United States called me and said, I'd like to come and see it for myself. Is there really anybody in this state who thinks what I should have said is, no, <laughs> go away. I don't want you to come. We'll go it on our own. <laughs> no. And that wouldn't be being loyal to the oath that I took as governor. And the fact that there are some people who are still angry, it, there is nowhere near a majority of people out in the field that way. And the angriest people are always the loudest people, as we know from Donald Trump. And, and I want to end this era of pointless anger in America. I get angry plenty, and I'm as tough as anybody in this race, if not tougher. But that emotion should be geared towards accomplishing something. Donald Trump's anger and where he's led our country is pointless anger. And that, in 2012, was pointless anger. It didn't make the difference between Mitt Romney winning or losing. It certainly didn't. He was going to lose anyway. And the fact is that I did what I knew was best for the people who had elected me. And that's exactly what I'll do as president. Next question from Thalia Flores. Welcome, Governor. Hi. Since 2000, George W. Bush is the only president to have won the popular vote. Um, it's all about the Electoral College to win the presidency, but is it a concern that Republicans may not have their finger on the pulse of the majority of the American people? You bet. And any Republican who's not concerned about it is stupid. <laughs> it's that simple. And you know, the fact is that <clears throat> we have not, since George W. Bush, appealed to suburban voters, mm -hmm. most particularly. We have not even more specifically appealed to suburban women. And it's because I think of this anger and intolerance that we've been exhibiting. You know, most of the time I think that if people feel like you won't listen to them, mm -hmm. they're not gonna vote for you. Mm -hmm. And that's why in my state, the first time I ran for governor, I won 60% of the independents. The second time I ran for governor, I won over 71% of the independents. <clears throat> the reason I did was because I listened, because I campaigned in those places and listened to people. And we have not been doing that as Republicans, and we haven't been doing it effectively. Or we show up really late and say, no, 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 trust me. People don't trust you if you show up right before Election Day. They trust you when you go to the tough places where you may get booed every once in a while or ask the tough question. I'm not worried about any of that. I was a Republican in New Jersey. I got that all the time. But in the end, what happened when I ran the first time? In a three-way race, I got 48% of the vote. Four years later, after doing a lot of tough things and going through a horrible natural disaster, I got 61% of the vote. And I think that was a referendum on the fact that I listened and I was unafraid to decide after I listened. That's what people want from a leader. And that's the road 
back to a majority of the vote mm -hmm. in 2024. If I'm the nominee, I'll guarantee you today I will get a majority of the vote, okay. both in the Electoral College and the popular vote. Thank you. Next question comes from Hella Ross. Thank you, Adam. Hello, Governor. Hella. I am deeply saddened by the recent fatal stabbing of O'Shea Sibley, a gay black professional dancer and choreographer who was simply dancing at a gas station in Brooklyn. As president, what qualities of yours can you tap into to offer to help to heal our nation and quell the level of hatred towards all minority communities that continues to exist and surface across our country? I think the only way to do it is to show people your heart and your soul. And I'll tell you that where my heart and my soul is, is that every life is a precious gift from God. No matter how that life has evolved and developed, no matter what their race or their color is, no matter what their gender is, no matter what their sexual orientation is, that every life is an individual gift from God to be treated with respect. And the president needs to be saying those things. And we have had too much, too much over the last eight years in particular of nothing but anger and hate words mm -hmm. coming from the Oval Office. And Joe Biden is almost as guilty of it as Donald Trump is. And he's been reacting to that. And it's, it's just wrong. The president of the United States should be inspirational to the people of this country, to our greater angels, our better angels, mm -hmm. and make them understand that every American, regardless of any of those differences, is someone that at the very, very least merits our respect and hopefully merits our affection. And no one's saying that anymore. I mean, those are easy words to say if they're in your heart, and they're in my heart. And I absolutely believe in the sanctity of every life that God has put on this earth. And when we do things like that, and we don't speak out against it because we think it may create a political problem for us, shame on us. And when Donald Trump stood up after Charlottesville and said there are good people on both sides, that sends the wrong message. I will tell you right now, there are no good white supremacists. There are no good Nazis. Sorry, they're not. They have hate in their heart. And so we need to speak clearly about that. And I think if we do, we can help to lower the temperature in this country a little bit and focus us back on the really important things that we need to be focused on, improving our kids' education, stopping this rampant crime in our cities, making our country more affordable for people, and making sure that we make friends all around the world to fight against people like the Chinese Communist Party, the theocracy in Iran, and the crazy man in North Korea, and the autocratic dictator in Russia, who Donald Trump calls brilliant and a great leader. Those words matter, and they lead to things like you just talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Quick follow-up, Governor. Let's say Ukraine wins the war and expels Russia from its borders. And the United States has a chance, like it had in the early 90s, to approach a different Russia, however that happens. What should the United States or the next president do to try to change the trajectory of Russia so you don't end up with the same situation over and over again? Well, first is to put Ukraine into NATO <clears throat> once the war is over. They've earned it. And they, by the way, will be the most hardened, best trained military force in NATO after what they've just gone through. Secondly, it depends on who the new leader of Russia is, Adam. If you have an autocratic maniac like Vladimir Putin, who replaces Vladimir Putin, there will be very little the United States can do to combat that. I want you to understand, I was just there just last Friday. I went to the town of Busha. When the Russians invaded there, the mayor told me about one particular street where the Russian soldiers went into every house, pulled the men out, gouged out their eyes while they were alive, tied their hands behind their back and shot them in the head, and then went into the homes and raped the women who were there. 
they went to the St. Michael's Cathedral on the top of the hill in Boucher. They killed 160 people, civilians, and buried them in a shallow grave behind that cathedral and ransacked the cathedral. And the mayor showed me a picture that a Reuters photographer had taken of a 10-year-old girl who was dead on the street, been shot by a Russian soldier. In her hand was her leash with her dead dog at the end of that leash. She was out walking her dog and was shot and killed by a Russian soldier. 19,000 children have been abducted from Ukraine by the Russian army, stolen from their families, and taken back to Russia to reprogram them to be anti-Ukraine. I met one of those mothers whose child was taken away from her. They don't know where their child is, if their child's dead or alive, being cared for or abused. This is the regime that Ukraine is fighting. This is not a territorial dispute, Governor DeSantis. This is not something we should ignore, Donald Trump. This is something that America stands up against. And those folks deserve and have earned our support. And they're not asking for one American man or woman to come there and fight their fight. They just want us to give them the weapons to help them win their fight. And that's what we need to do. We've got an online question coming from Alyssa Anderson, who asks, how do you plan to address the nationwide teacher shortage? Look, I think that in both two areas, teachers and nurses, we have a shortage in both in this country right now. And part of the reason for that is because we are asking too much of them. You know, teachers now these days are being asked to be everything. Not only a teacher in the classroom, a counselor, an overseer, a substitute parent during the day. Teachers need to teach and parents need to be even more involved in their kids' lives. And so I think part of it is to say to teachers, we want you to focus on what your job is and we're gonna help relieve you of these other duties. But secondly, um, it is to make this education to become a teacher more affordable. The cost of college education is out of control, completely out of control. And it's hard to justify taking out some of the loans that people have to take to pay for this education um, to then become a teacher. And so we need to crack down on these colleges and universities, and I have a plan to do that, who are charging exorbitant amounts way above the rate of inflation for an education that can help prepare a teacher to get in the front of that classroom. We're pricing ourselves out of that market. Next question comes from Dina Berger. Welcome, Governor Christie. Thank you, Dina. Um, my concern is the high price of medication. Drug prices have really gone out of sight, and I'm wondering what you would do to lower those prices and also eliminate some of the ads on TV. If you've watched TV one evening, three to five ads for drugs, how can we eliminate those and uh, get our prices down? Well, you have just picked up on one of my pet peeves, <laughs> which are those TV advertisements. Look, if there is a man in this country over 55 years of age who doesn't know there's a little blue pill they can take, they're lost, okay? We don't need another advertisement for that. Every different drug. I want to learn about these drugs from my doctor. Not from television. Right. How do I know whether that's the best drug for me? Because they're saying it on TV, it makes no sense. And they spend too much money on it. And that money could be used to lower the price of drugs. Secondly, we have something that a lot, a lot of people know about called physician or, or prescription benefit managers. They are the middlemen between the drug companies and you. So here are the drug companies, and in many of the top-line drugs, they give 60 and 70% rebates on the list price. And you know who takes 70 to 80% of that rebate? The middlemen, the prescription benefit managers. I will tell you this, I don't know what purpose they serve in this country. And if I were President of the United States, my view would be they need to be gone. Those rebates that the pharmaceutical companies give should go to you. Not to some middleman who pushes paper and gets the drugs from one manufacturing place to your drugstore. We need 
to control the price of the way that's done because that brings no value to you at all. Because what I'm concerned about is if we clamp down even harder on the pharmaceutical companies, that will wind up stunting innov innovation. And you know, we get the best drugs first in this country that help to extend and improve life because they're developed in this country and paid for by the American consumer. We don't want to get fifth in line. So we need to figure out the way to squeeze that out. I think the TV advertising, which we never used to have before and then was permitted. So it was permitted by law, can be prevented by law. And these, pers these uh, prescription benefit managers need to go. Those are two ways that I think we can really bring prices down and get those rebates that the pharma companies give already and get it directly to you, not to the people in the between. Thank you. You're welcome. Another online question that might be a bit of a parallel topic here, but Dylan Gray asks, what is your plan to fix the broken VA system and get New Hampshire veterans the proper care they deserve? It's to supplement the VA system. And I think that every veteran who's dis who is honorably discharged should get a health card that allows them to go to any doctor they want, any hospital they want. The VA system is a well-meaning system that does a lot of good in this country. So I don't want to run the VA system down. There are good, hardworking men and women who work at those VA facilities every day who are trying to do the best they can, but they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed by the demand in the system, Adam, and so we need to supplement it. And, you know, as we talked about before regarding Medicare, we need to allow these folks to access a system at a younger age after they've left the armed forces that allows them to go to the doctor they want and the hospital that they want. That's the way to do it. I know President Trump was up here yesterday saying he's going to build a new VA hospital right here in New Hampshire. Complete baloney. He's going to build that hospital the same way he built that wall on the border between the U.S. and Mexico, okay? He's coming up here and lying to you to try to buy your vote. He's a charlatan. Understand it. It's the truth. If he thought that a New Hampshire Veterans Hospital was so important, how come he never spoke it until yesterday? He was the President of the United States for four years. Where was he? No, now when he wants your vote, he comes back and puts a shiny object in front of you, which will never, ever happen. The same way his wall never happened, the same way his balanced budget never happened. The only people who make money when Donald Trump is president their last name is Trump. They're the only ones who make money under Donald Trump. Remember that. On the merits, though, Governor, is a full-service hospital a good idea for New Hampshire? I don't know. Because I don't know whether or not the cost of building a new hospital and the amount of access that it would provide to people and the level of care it would provide. What specialties are in the hospital, Adam? And are they supplementing what's already available through the other parts of the system? If we give people access to the medical system we already have built for every other citizen, and we give veterans access to that, we know they're going to get the care they need then. The same way every other citizen who has access to insurance or Medicare or private insurance gets access to that care. And that's exactly what our veterans deserve and not a nickel less. Next question from Maura Carroll. Thank you for being here, Governor. You're welcome. I'm sure when you were governor of New Jersey, you worked closely with many local officials. Sure did. And I've heard it said that the level of government that gets things done is local government. So my question to you is, as president, what would you do and what policies would you support to ensure that the federal government is assisting local officials in carrying out the really important roles of public safety, infrastructure maintenance, planning, recreation, zoning, and the like? Well, the first thing on recreational planning, zoning, um, and, all, and planning, stay the hell out of your way, okay? Don't be imposing things through the EPA and other things that make your job more difficult. Now, on infrastructure, we just passed a bipartisan trillion dollar infrastructure bill, yet we have the former mayor of South Bend implementing it. Now look, I've been to South Bend, okay? I've had two daughters who have gone to the University of Notre Dame. One who's there now, one who graduated in 2018. If the roads in South Bend are any indication of how well Pete Buttigieg can do, he should resign tomorrow, all right? And so we need a Secretary of Transportation who's gonna make it easy for you to access that money. I don't, we passed it a year ago. I don't see any of the money anywhere. 
And you look at what it's like to travel by air this summer. It's outrageous. Where's the investment in the FAA? Where's the investment in more air traffic controllers? Where's the investment in improving airports? It, the money is there. We've appropriated a trillion dollars. But we have people who don't know how to run things. So the best way I can help the localities to get the money for their roads, their bridges, um, their local tunnels and airports is to put someone competent in charge of the Department of Transportation to say, here's the check. Show me what your plans are. Approved, move, and let you run it. Let you decide which roads you should pave, which ones you shouldn't, which bridges need improvement and which don't. And the federal government should help you pay for it, but they should keep their nose out of it otherwise, in my view. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, Governor, did you ever encounter Mayor Pete in South Bend? Yeah. In <laughs> fact, my first day when I was moving, I was governor, and I was moving my daughter into her dorm. This will show you what an ambitious son of a gun this guy is. I, like, I'm there, I'm moving, I'm, I'm, like every other father, right? I mean, I had a couple of troopers, but beside that, <laughs> like every other father, I'm loading stuff out of the back of an SUV, boxes. And all of a sudden, this really young guy comes up to me and says, Governor, how are you? It's great to be here. Great to have you here. I want to let you know if your daughter ever needs anything while she's here, just let me know. I had no idea who this guy was. And he looked young enough that he could have been a student or like a graduate student there. And finally, at the end of it, he said, and I'm Mayor Pete Buttigieg, so here's my card. And if you need anything, I'm like, first of all, how the hell did he know I was here? <laughs> How did he know which dorm I was in? And then I was unloading boxes. So yeah, that was my interaction with Mayor Pete, um, giving me his card and offering to like help my daughter in some way while she was at Notre Dame. To the best of my knowledge, she never called on him for any help, but um, he, he was there to offer me help the day I was moving her in. <laughs> Next question from Marie Mulroy. Yeah, hi. Marie. And I think you've touched on this a little bit, but over the last several presidential elections, almost every candidate says they're the one who's going to finally heal this divide, kind of reconcile the sides, and so that we can get back to a civil conversation. So my question is two-part. One, why do you think it has not happened yet? And secondly, how, what would you do differently to finally ease this tension that's in this country? Well, the reason it hasn't happened is twofold. One, either they didn't mean it, and they felt like the divide helped them politically. Or two, they just didn't know how. And, and so let's take the, the, they didn't mean it part. You know, for some people, Donald Trump in particular, conflict, as we can see, serves him well. It helps him. So he wants more and more and more and more and more conflict, right? So you got to be aware not to elect people like that. Second, on the don't know part, I mean, does Governor DeSantis sound like somebody who's looking to heal the divide? I mean, I just listened to him. Look, I don't know him. I really don't. We didn't serve at the same time with each other. As he was coming in, I was going out. So I don't know him personally, but I just listened to him. Mm -hmm. He sounds like a really angry guy. He's squinting his eyes all the time. He's, like, he's pissed about something, you know? Like, like I don't, I, so, I, so I'm skeptical, right? I'm skeptical that somebody who's that angry cares about healing the divide or has the ability to do it, right? And I, I think, quite frankly, because of the experience I had in New Jersey of working with the other side and keeping things together. It's not like we never fought, of course we fought. But then when we fought, we, we got to the end of it. We made a deal or we didn't, and we moved on to the next topic. The only person who I think sounds like someone who's interested in this, to be honest, is Tim Scott. Mm -hmm. And I think Tim has in his heart the willingness to want to do that, I really do. Um, I don't know if he has the ability to do it because he's never run anything. He's been a congressman and a senator, and I think you need to also combine those two. The willingness has to be in your heart, and you have to know how to do it. Um, and I think Tim and I are the only ones who are using any rhetoric that would make you believe they have the willingness in their heart to do it. And I don't know if Tim has the ability to do it or not. I'm not saying he doesn't. I just don't know that he does. Governor, can, as we wrap up here, can you name any Democrats currently on Capitol Hill that you would envision yourself working with? Oh, yeah, plenty. I mean, um, Joe Manchin, obviously, is somebody who, he was my mentor governor. When I got elected in 2009, he was the governor of West Virginia, and he got assigned by the Governor's Association to be my mentor governor. And for the whole first year that I was governor, I got to talk to Joe. I called him on a regular basis to get his advice. He's, he's a wonderful guy. Kristen Cinema, I think, is another person who's reasonable, who you can talk to and you can deal with. Um, I know a guy like Josh Gottheimer, who's a congressman from New Jersey, Democrat, 
but I think a very reasonable one in the Problem Solvers Caucus and somebody that I think is willing to sit and listen and reason and compromise with people. So there's three off the top of my head. And, you know, if we were going to have a quiz and you had a piece of paper, my guess is I could come up with 20 or 25, which is a start, given that I've never worked in Washington. <laughs> so then once I get there, though, my job is going to be, Adam, to make sure that I find out what they're about. Now, I might meet some people. I, I doubt AOC and I are having dinner together. <laughs> That's probably unlikely. I'm going to keep her at the bottom of the list. If I get to AOC, we're not doing well, I don't think. <laughs> but I want to get to know these people. I want to get to know their families. I want to get to know what they care about, why they ran in the first place, what they're hoping to accomplish when they're there. Can I help them accomplish what they want to accomplish without violating my principles? Once you start to do those things, and that's a lot of time and a lot of work, but when you get to know that, then when you pick up the phone and ask them for their help on something, it's harder to say no. Or you say to them, look, you know, remember that one thing you were looking for that you really wanted to do? I can help you do that, but you need to help me do this. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the way the government should work when there are people of different opinions coming together to try to solve problems. So I do it the same way I did it in New Jersey. And um, I suspect it'd be harder, um, but you go, there's some tough Democrats in New Jersey, you go see them. Um, I think I'd do well. All right, Governor Chris Christie, we've hit the 30 minute mark. Adam, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us on thank Conversation with the Thank you all for coming candidate. today, I appreciate thank it. Thank you to our town hall audience and thank you for watching.